What I'm going to have you do is introduce yourself, first and last name, where we are today, the school, and what you taught, you know. So go for it. Okay. I'm Jessica Galbraith, Bethel High School, and I was teaching a lesson in the AP Human Geography class of grades 10th and 11th graders, and the lesson was on globalization. All right, I'm going to cut this. Is there a so starting out? We want to understand the decisions you made in planning for this lesson and how it fits into the unit in the year. How does this lesson connect to and build on students' prior skills and knowledge? Well, this lesson was part of actually a four lesson sequence that I did um, where I introduced the students to the Hungry Planet project of photographs and we really talked about the author and what his message was and how it related to other topics in our course like culture and family life and health and income. Um, and then today I asked them to really build on that and introduce some of the data tables that we have and um, synthesize all that information together to really determine what the author's message was in terms of globalization. So not just his overall message, but his message about globalization. Um, it's part of our unit on culture, um, and that unit has a lot of facets to it, but one overarching theme of the unit is globalization. So I thought that was a really important concept to, to get at um, in this particular lesson. Um, this, third, this is our third unit of the year out of a seven unit sequence. You are doing that, awesome. <coughs> How does this lesson connect to and build on students' prior skills and knowledge? What was taught before this lesson and what will come after it? Okay. Well, um, what was taught before this lesson is that students have been engaged in the unit on culture. That's part of our curriculum for the AP Human Geography course. And we've been looking at Peter Menzel's Hungry Planet photographs, his whole project. We've been listening to him speak, and we've been really analyzing his pictures, making observations and inferences about what his message is in this photography project. Um, what's gonna come after this is that students will be taking what they did today in terms of analyzing his message, Peter Menzel's message about globalization, and turning that into their own thoughts about globalization, whether they feel it's a positive or negative force in society. In terms of the skills, they've been working on in class how to observe a picture and then make an inference from it. Um, you know, I feel like it's an important social studies skill for students to get because they're so used to reading a written text and making inferences from that that I thought it would be a nice way to have them carry that skill over to a visual artifact such as a photograph. Um, and one of the other skills that we're working on in terms of literacy is how to really think about what the author is trying to say and what their message is. So again, I kind of flipped that what the author's message is to be what the artist's or photographer's message is. Oh, great. I want oh, to sweat off my nose. You're good. Still medium. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. So, we are moving on to the next question. Is the text used in this lesson part of a sequence of text designed to build skills and knowledge? If so, please give an example of other texts that form this sequence. So, let me read that one more time. Is the text used in this lesson part of a sequence of text designed to build skills and knowledge? If so, please give an example of other texts that form this sequence. Um, well, there were three texts that were referenced today in class, so they did build a sequence altogether. Um, the first text that students saw were the photographs that were actually taken by the photographer Peter Menzel. The second text was the globalization informational article that students read. And then the third text was the data table that contained statistics about the countries um, in terms of their demographics, in terms of their eating habits, in terms of their income level. Um, so I designed the text to build on each other and to introduce different concepts that were a part of the lesson sequence. Um, and I thought that I held on to the data table for the last text because I thought that that was the most um, informative of all three texts. So I wanted to kind of give that one last because it gave the students a chance to think critically about the globalization article and about the photographs before I provided them with the factual statistics about the country, which kind of you can't argue with. Talk about the standards targeted in this lesson. What did you do to make the lesson reflect the full intent of that standard? 
Um, the standard that I focused on from the Common Core was evaluating an author's premise and claim and then either corroborating or challenging that claim with other sources. Um, so we've been working on observing and inferring an author's message, but then today I really wanted them to be evaluating what the author Menzel's message was and how they could support that or challenge that with the other text that they had. Um, and so that was the standard I was really hoping that they were able to, to hit at today in terms of the, the Common Core literacy skills. Which of the core action indicators do you think this lesson best exemplifies and why? Um, I think that this lesson best exemplified core actions one and two and also three, but I, the planning that went into creating the questions uh, and tasks were really designed to center around the text and force the students to go back to the text in order to answer the questions. Um, so, and it, you know, the whole lesson was centered around three texts actually, but a text. So that's, you know, where it covered correction one and with correction two, like I said, I, the questions and tasks just really centered around the text and couldn't be answered without the students going back to the data table and the pictures. Um, Correction three, I feel like was also addressed, but I do feel that it fell short a little bit in terms of being accessible for all students because I have a few students, three in particular, that do struggle more than the other students in the class. And um, because of the shortened time, I wasn't able to really deliver some of the scaffolds and modeling that I had built into place that would have helped them to be um, at the same level as the rest of the class. We're interested in the shifts required by the CCSS are being incorporated into your instruction. Discuss how this lesson illustrates the shifts required by the CCSS. Um, I think that one of the biggest shifts that I've made in my own instruction is really thinking about the purposeful use of text in my lessons as opposed to viewing it as just a supplement, but really looking at it as an opportunity to incorporate some of the key skills that we find students lacking in, um, such as you know reading closely, annotating, really spending time with text and, and looking for main ideas um, within the terms of photographs, those making of inferences and, and those assumptions, and then trying to back up and find evidence to support those inferences. Um, in the past, I think I would have used, or I have used this same text but more as an activity and not something that I had built my whole lesson sequence around. Um, and I certainly in the past had not focused so much on the skills required and the thinking required for students to really dig deeply into the photographs and the text. In the past, I probably would have presented them and been more um, informative to students as opposed to letting them really spend time digging deeply into the photographs themselves. I feel like I'm making no sense. You can cut You're that part. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's edited, so don't worry. <laughs> How did you teach the content of this lesson prior to the CCSS? What is the I kind of just said that. Oops. And what is different? I kind of just said that, so I'll just try to say it better. Okay. Okay. You want me to read again? Or you yes, please. Okay. How did you teach <clears throat> the content of this lesson or this text prior to the CCSS? What is the same and what's different? In the past, I've used these same resources, this Hungry Planet photographs, um, as a supplement in the culture unit to highlight the differences between different cultures. Um, and it was something I presented as a PowerPoint to students, and um, students really liked the opportunity to see the pictures from other countries and to see what people lead around the world. But I had never in the past given students the time to really explore and think deeply about the photographs. Um, and that's what I've done differently now because I've tried to put the text of these photographs at the center of the lesson and make them what the teaching is about versus using them as a supplement um, to the content. Student engagement is crucial to the work of a CCSS. We want to understand how you ensure that all students have the opportunity to productively engage, engage in the work lesson. How did you support all students in working with grade level text? For example, how did you provide scaffolding for students below grade level so they can read at grade level text? Um, in preparing this lesson, I had purposefully 
built this as a lesson sequence because I knew students would need time with the photographs themselves to analyze, make those observations, really see what was in the pictures and then start to make those inferences. I created a set of guiding questions for students. Um, and originally I had planned to just give them to students that I saw struggling. But in the end, I ended up providing it to all students so that they had some questions to kind of get them started when looking at a photograph because sometimes students aren't sure how to use that as a text um, and what kind of questions to ask themselves. So I provided some, some really rich analysis questions so that students could could approach the photographs with a, with a purpose. Um, and then for students that, when I was, sorry. It's okay. Another thing that I did to help scaffold and support students that were weaker was that I made sure to purposefully group the students together. Um, and I didn't necessarily group them based on grade or you know their scores on tests, but I grouped them based on the strengths and weaknesses that I see in my students. So some students are more vocal, some tend to be quieter and have more of a, a written expression, and some just need help um, in approaching text and in how to read um, different types of text. So I tried to put you know three or four students together that balanced each other out so that they would all have an opportunity to shine in their groups. And then continuing on that question, what opportunities did you provide for students who are advanced to engage more deeply with the grade level text? Let me think about that for a second. Okay. Okay. Do you need to read it again or no? Yeah, I'll read okay. it again if you want. Let's see. Advanced. How did you create opportunities for students who are advanced to engage more deeply with grade level or grade level text? Grade level text. <laughs> um, to make sure that all students, even those that were more advanced, were still challenged, I allowed students to have plenty of time and choice in the first couple of lessons that were part of this sequence. So when students were exploring the website, students were allowed to choose which website, which pictures and countries they were focused on. So some chose the more challenging countries that we didn't know a lot about, and other people that were maybe struggling a little more stuck to countries that they were familiar with. Some chose the United States, some chose Western European countries, countries, but the students who are more advanced were able to choose countries that were more of a challenge, ones that they didn't know as much about. Um, so that's one way that I allowed them to have that, that challenge. Um, and also with the data table, what I saw was that students that were more advanced were better able to use that data table to corroborate what they were saying in class and also understanding the more um, the more complex data that was contained in the table. There were things like life expectancy that were pretty straightforward, but there were other statistics that I provided students that were a little more challenging, such as um, the amount of the population living below $2 a day or the amount of underweight children below the age of five. And those statistics were a little harder for students to understand, but I found the more advanced students going to those statistics when they were um, using the data table. Sorry, I just rubbed that. That probably uh -huh. hurt your ears. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, we're good. Let's see. How do you know? How do you know the students were able to successfully respond to the text-dependent questions and tasks with precision? Let me look. <laughs> you want me to take a pause? Mm-hmm. So how did you know the students were able to successfully respond in the text-dependent questions and tasks with precision? Did students acquire the literary skills addressed in the lesson? Um, well, I know that students did struggle with the text-dependent questions because as I walked around the room, I could see that they were having some trouble taking the question and connecting it to that concept of globalization. But as I walked around and was able to provide some questions for students and help them along in their thinking, I found that when they were filling out the two columns of the chart, the column with evidence from the text actually grew to be much um, larger and longer than I had expected. So they were able to answer the questions in, our, in terms of Menzel's message about globalization, and then they were able to gather multiple pieces of evidence to support those conclusions um, and all of the evidence came from the text. So it really challenged them and forced them to go back to the text in all cases to support the assertions they were making. What do you do? What did you do for the students who did not acquire literary skills addressed in this lesson? 
Well, I found that all students were able to read the text, make observations and draw inferences. Some needed more help from their peers and from myself, but in the end, when I walked around, because it is such a small group, and when I'm looking at their charts and responses, they were all able to read the text of the pictures and of the data um, in the data table. So I know that they were able to do that. Um, in looking at their responses from the very end of class, they were all able to really evaluate what Menzel was saying about globalization, and they were all able to come to a conclusion about whether he thought it was positive or negative. So I know that they were able to evaluate his claim by stating whether it was positive or negative. What I did find that they were still lacking in was evidence and reasons for whether they viewed it as positive and negative. But I do feel like that was in part due to the lack of time they had at the end of class to really elaborate on their answers. So that's something I'm going to follow up with in class tomorrow and you know, give them some additional time to go back and, and add that evidence and really elaborate on why they thought it was either positive or negative from Menzel's perspective. Which behaviors from Core Action 3 did the students best exemplify in this lesson and what actions have you taken as a teacher to make that happen? I don't know if you need to pause again, but I just need to reread Correction 3. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> Which behaviors from Correction 3 did the students best exemplify, and what actions have you taken as a teacher to make that happen? One of the things I've really been working on that's related to Correction 3 with my class is their ability to build on each other's responses and take what one person says and use that to um, to spark their own thinking about the subject. And I thought that they did a really nice job of that, especially in their small groups. And when one person would, would share an observation or an inference or a conclusion and another person would build on that or connect something to the thoughts of their, their fellow group member. So I thought that was something they did really well with. And they also persisted at times when they were struggling a little bit. Um, and that's one of the reasons, you know, when I chose the groups, I made sure that they had a, a nice balance so that they would be able to support each other in that. Um, so I thought they were really able to persist in their reading, their writing, their speaking about the text. They didn't submit any work, did they? Um, they did. Okay. Do you want to comment on any of the... That's, I mean, they have it in the... They did the stuff on the computer, and then I have some... I have other folders, but I don't look at them yet. Like... I don't know. Question four says, great instructors are continuously learning. We want to understand what you celebrated in this lesson and what you would improve upon. Reflecting on the lesson, what worked particularly well and what might you do differently? I was really impressed with how my students immediately were able to draw the connections between, global, between globalization and what Menzel was doing in his pictures. Um, even before I had even started asking them to think forward about globalization, they were already thinking about it, and they were really able to come up with examples of globalization providing positive and negative impacts for the countries that they were looking at. Um, so I thought that was really great. Was there a second part? I'm sorry. Nope. Okay. Do you feel good with that? Well, reflecting on the lesson, what worked particularly well and what might you do differently? Um, what worked well was that students were prepared with how to bring all three of the texts together because we had taken time in the previous lessons to look at the skill of observing and drawing inferences from photographs. So then when I asked them to do that, but also layer on the other two texts, which was a more difficult task, they were able to do that because they had the foundational skills that we had established in the previous class. Um, what I would do differently is that I would actually have spent more time on the lessons leading up to today and also have structured today's lesson in a way that didn't feel so rushed because I did not allow, I didn't, was not able to allow students enough time to really fill out their globalization chart. Um, but in the end, I was really impressed with how they were able to respond individually already thinking about Menzel's message about globalization, even though they didn't have all the time that I had wanted them to have in their groups. Um, and I think that's probably why I saw the lacking in their elaboration in their responses is because they hadn't had quite as much time in their groups to really explore um, the whole entire chart. Were there any surprises or unexpected student behaviors or reactions? 
There was one student who um, was sitting towards the back and he, when we first were, when I first went around to the groups, he didn't have out the initial homework that I had asked them to be sharing. Um, and he didn't have it out and he, he was rifling through his notebook looking for it and he seemed to be doing, we can start that over. <laughs> right. <laughs> we may have to, right? <laughs> Is it gonna beep again? In three minutes, but I can finish before oh, okay. then. Okay. Were there any surprises or unexpected student behaviors or reactions? The one student that I that was sitting towards the back of the room, he didn't have the homework. <laughs> That's gonna happen though. Miss Peters, uh, four zero one. Peters. Sorry. Was there any surprises or unexpected student behaviors or reactions? Well, there was one student who was sitting towards the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that. Don't don't let me swear on, ca on camera. <laughs> we'll cut it. No worries. No worries. I've already done that too. So <clears throat> Were there any surprises or unexpected student behaviors or reactions? There was one student sitting towards the back of the room that when I went around and was asking them to be discussing their homework, um, he was rifling through his backpack looking for it and it became kind of clear he didn't have it and um, he seemed to be trying to do everything he could to get out of having the conversation with his with his classmates. So I tried to redirect him and um, you know tell him that maybe he could do the inputting into the computer if he couldn't find his homework and eventually I went back to him and he found the homework, but it wasn't done. So, you know, I instructed him to do it for the next class. So, you know, so I guess that was not necessarily um, abnormal, but slightly unexpected because the rest of them seemed to all have their homework done and were prepared. So, great, you're done. Yay. Yay.